the bulk of the support consists of aged weaponry. For instance, in the latest allocation of funds, around $750 million, only 33 Patriot missiles are included. These missiles, used for air defense against aircraft and cruise missiles, are quickly depleted in a conflict scenario. Given the scale of the threat, particularly the thousands of projectiles launched by opposing forces, relying solely on these resources is untenable. The Russian military, though, initially caught off guard in February 2022, has since adapted and continued to bolster its capabilities. Presently, they maintain a significant presence, with approximately 750,000 troops stationed in and around Ukraine, a number expected to rise to 1.2 million over the coming year. Mobilization efforts extend to various sectors, including reservists, university students, and professionals, reflecting a growing readiness to confront perceived Western aggression. It's imperative to recognize the consequences of our actions, which have fueled Russian resolve and deepened tensions. A recalibration of strategy is urgently needed to prevent further escalation and reach a settlement, even if it's not entirely favorable to our interests. A prospect of hundreds of thousands of Russian troops amassing near the Polish border underscores the urgency of the situation and the need for a swift resolution to avoid further destabilization. The latest estimates show that since 2001, the United States has spent approximately $14 trillion on military endeavors, including interventions and conflicts, such as the one in Ukraine. Much of this spending has been debt finance, contributing to the ballooning national sovereign debt. When you break down these figures against the backdrop of the workforce with around 130 million workers, it becomes apparent that each working adult in the country carries a considerable debt burden, averaging around $200,000 to $240,000. This financial strain is especially felt by everyday Americans, who earn an average of $31,000 annually and pay roughly $16,600 in taxes per year. Contrastingly, the financial realities of those within the political corridors of power on Capitol Hill, or within the Beltway diverge greatly from those of ordinary citizens. While an individual who has worked their entire life and relies on social security may receive a modest monthly payment of $1,400, asylum seekers and illegal migrants arriving at the border are provided with $2,200 monthly allowances. The financial juxtaposition between these scenarios is perplexing and underscores broader issues of equity and fairness. Moreover, many Americans, while lacking in-depth knowledge about Ukraine or Eastern European history, question the rationale behind continued involvement in distant conflicts characterized by long-standing animosities. The sentiment is growing that such interventions are futile and only serve to exacerbate tensions. At the heart of the matter lies a profound sense of disillusionment with the government. Many citizens perceive a disconnect between their desires and the decisions made by policymakers. The pervasive influence of wealthy donors further compounds this disillusionment, fueling a sense of disenfranchisement among the populace. In essence, the current state of affairs represents a dire erosion of democratic principles and accountability. There's a growing recognition among Americans that significant changes are needed to restore faith in the political process and ensure that the voices of ordinary citizens are heard and respected. Firstly, it's crucial to delve into the backgrounds of the donors and understand their motivations. Many of them likely harbor personal interests driving their contributions. Secondly, examining the financial incentives they stand to gain is essential. It's not merely about heavy investments in the defense industry. Reports like the one from the Oakland Institute shed light on broader interests, including control over Ukraine's arable land known as the breadbasket of Europe. A fertile soil of Ukraine is coveted by various entities, including oligarchs both in Eastern Europe and potentially in the West. This underscores the multifitted nature of interest supply. Additionally, politicians on Capitol Hill, such as McConnell, often propagate narratives that may not necessarily align with reality. Claims of significant setbacks to Russia or assertions about the efficacy of military aid to Ukraine sometimes diverge from the truth. Moreover, a cycle of military spending perpetuates a self-serving system. Funds allocated to the Defense Department eventually find their way back to industry players through various channels, including political action committees. 
This creates a circular flow of money enriching stakeholders at each stage of the process. In the context of Ukraine, the influx of military equipment doesn't always translate into improved capabilities for the troops. Much of the equipment ends up being resold or finds its way into illicit markets such as arms bazaars, or even into the hands of drug cartels. Extensions of sophisticated weaponry like javelin missiles surfacing in unexpected places underscore the challenges of managing arms transfers and their unintended consequences. During World War II at its peak, around the end of 1942 and into 1943, the United States managed its military affairs with just seven four-star generals. These included figures like George Marshall, Douglas MacArthur, Dwight Eisenhower, Hap Arnold, Admiral Leahy, Chester Nimitz and Ernest King. Despite the limited number of top commanders, the U.S. successfully navigated through one of the most devastating conflicts in history. Fast forward to the present day and we find ourselves with an abundance of 43 to 44 four-star generals, each leading various commands across the globe. However, this proliferation of top-ranking officers might be deemed excessive, especially given the realities of the 21 ST century. In today's world, having a large number of forces deployed forward poses significant risks. Advanced technologies and the global reach of adversaries mean that forward deployers are easily identifiable and vulnerable to attack. A notion of being able to swiftly reinforce these forces in the face of threats is also questionable considering the challenges posed by hostile submarine fleets and the vulnerability of supply lines. Moreover, the United States finds itself in a new era where conflicts abroad can have direct implications at home. The recent authorization of combat pay for Americans serving in Ukraine underscores the significant presence of U.S. personnel in the region. Despite Russian restraint thus far, precision strikes along the borders of neighboring countries send a clear message. There's no hiding from Russian firepower. Acknowledging these realities doesn't reflect a lack of patriotism, but rather a pragmatic assessment of the situation. The speaker emphasizes that unnecessary conflict should be avoided, especially considering the profound consequences and the futility of engaging in battles that serve no strategic purpose. Thinking of the military capacity like an engine provides a clear analogy. In 1991, we had a robust 500 horsepower engine symbolizing our military might. However, over time, that horsepower has dwindled significantly. It's akin to seeing the engine power decrease from 500 to 400 down to 300, 200, and eventually to just 100. While for daily tasks like commuting or short trips, this reduced power may not be immediately noticeable, pushing the engine to its limits reveals its weaknesses. This decline in military strength is a critical warning sign that people need to grasp. Despite the massive spending on the military, questions linger about what we've truly gained from it. The structure of our armed forces is fragmented, with each service operating independently, fostering bureaucratic inefficiencies. The idea of joint operations remains more of a concept than a reality. The proliferation of generals and the bureaucracy surrounding them only exacerbate the issue. Consider our involvement in Africa, particularly in places like Niger. The decision to intervene there ostensibly to combat Islamists has backfired. Instead of extremism, our presence seems to have exacerbated tensions, leading to a coup and resentment from the local population. Rather than reflecting on our missteps, there's a tendency to attribute blame elsewhere, whether to Russian mercenaries or Chinese influence. It's crucial to recognize that our military personnel faithfully carry out orders, often putting their lives on the line. However, these missions don't always align with national interests or the well-being of the American people. Blind allegiance to symbols like the flag or patriotic tunes can overshadow the stark reality of our diminished military capabilities, and the questionable decisions guiding our foreign interventions. Regarding Ukraine, there's a consensus among the American populace that supporting Ukraine in its struggle is essential. However, the question remains. Do we maintain our current level of commitment, expand it, or scale it back? The speaker advocates for increasing support to Ukraine, suggesting that investing now to bolster Ukrainian defenses is preferable to facing a potentially costlier conflict in the future, such as defending Taiwan. 
When we were in Vietnam, I was 16, and I recall General Westmore learning that if we didn't fight the enemy there, we'd end up fighting them in Los Angeles and other major cities. The gravity of that statement stuck with me. Why? Well, democracy seems to be a far cry from reality in many parts of the world and increasingly even at home. The notion of democracy feels somewhat hollow these days. Americans are gradually awakening to this reality. Christie's bid for political prominence likely hinges more on name recognition and financial support than actual victory. Doesn't this political spectacle divert attention from more pressing domestic concerns? Absolutely. Christie's rhetoric about defeating the Russians costs him nothing, but it exacts a heavy toll on the country in terms of finances, reputation, and creditworthiness. Now, the recent credit downgrade by Fitch underscores our precarious economic situation, yet few dare to confront the harsh truth of our overextension and financial vulnerability. What about our economy? What are we building, producing? The foundation of our past greatness, the robust industrial base from 1865 to 1920, seems distant. Innovators like Edison, Tesla, and Rockefeller drove that era.